This episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast, is brought to you in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher's cell therapy processing instruments are designed to help customers transition from process development to commercial manufacturing, utilized as standalone devices or integrated as part of a closed modular process. Thermo Fisher Scientific recommends Gibco CTS DynaSelect Magnetic Separation System, which is a next gen cell isolation and activation instrument. Gibco CTS Xenon Electroporation System allows customers full control to optimize for a variety of cell types and payloads. And Gibco CTS Rotea Counterflow Centrifugation System is a closed cell processing system supporting a broad range of protocols for cell separation, washing, and concentration. Customers can rely on and streamline their drug development process with Applied Biosystems Qualtrack qPCR and dPCR quality control tools for robust and reliable genetic analysis across various phases of drug development, supported by relevant, compliant documentation. Hello, listeners, and welcome to this episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Harris, and I'm happy to introduce to you my guest, Dr. Andrew Anzalone. He is the head of the Prime Editing Platform and scientific co-founder of Prime Medicine. Andrew, welcome to Cell and Gene, the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Aaron. It's a pleasure to meet you and talk to you today. Good, good. All right, so let's talk about Prime Medicine. So explain to our audience what Prime Medicine is and a little bit about its mission. Yeah, sure. Um, so Prime Medicine is a, a biotechnology company that was founded to uh, basically deliver on the promise of a new gene editing technology that's called Prime Editing. Um, so this is a technology that was uh, developed by my colleagues and I at, at the Broad Institute in the laboratory of David Blue. Um, and it's a, a gene editing technology, which I can describe in a little bit more detail uh, a little bit later, but it has the ability to correct uh, mutations uh, in uh, human genes that cause disease. Uh, and therefore, Prime Medicine is, is built around this technology uh, to try to uh, address certain disorders that have a genetic component. Um, so many different uh, diseases are caused by uh, mutations that are either inherited uh, from uh, patients' parents or also, uh, some in some cases, uh, uh, generated de novo. Um, and so these mutations are, are linked very strongly to the diseases that they have. Uh, and our approach broadly is to go and correct those those mutations, so make a change uh, that could restore it back to the normal sequence and restore the normal function of that gene, and then uh, with the hope that that would restore the health uh, to that patient. And, and there's a lot of promise in this approach. Um, it has the potential to be a one-time treatment um, that can correct the mutation. And once that correction occurs, it's expected to be very durable uh, and long lasting. So um, uh, there's a lot of promise, I think, in this general area of genetic medicines. Um, and our, our programs are, are broad, and uh, I think we'll go into them a little bit later as well, but we're looking to translate this technology into therapeutics for multiple different disease areas. This includes uh, diseases that affect the blood, diseases that, that affect the liver, uh, the eye, the ear, uh, muscle, lung, central nervous system, and, and even beyond that. So uh, we think that we can apply this technology broadly, and that's what we're currently exploring. Good, good. Yeah, definitely throughout the course of this discussion, we'll, we'll get into your pipeline for sure. But before mm -hmm. we do that, uh, on Cell and Gene, we talk about gene editing quite frequently, and mm -hmm. more specifically, uh, lately, we've been, we've been covering prime editing more and more. Um, from your perspective, tell us, you know, what is prime editing? I know we covered it a little bit at the top of the call here, but... Mm -hmm. What is it? How does it work? What do our listeners need to know about it in general? Yeah, no, great question. So, you know, as I said, it's a gene editing technology and we make an analogy that I think helps sort of explain the concept behind prime editing. And that analogy is that it, it's a system that acts like a DNA word processor. So, you know, when you're going to, to uh, construct a, a, a word document, a lot of times you use these features like search and replace if you're trying to find a particular word and replace it with a new one to correct an error potentially in the, in the um, draft manuscript that you're putting together in a, in a very similar way, the prime editing system can look for a very specific disease causing mutation in the genome 
and then change it to a sequence that is, again, a healthy or, or wild type or normal in function. Um, uh, and it has this very uh, modular search and replace function. So um, in principle, you can go to many different places in the genome by changing what that search sequence is, and then you can change that sequence to many other types of sequence. And it's very flexible in that regard. So you can make many different types of changes. Uh, and so the versatility behind this kind of mechanism, this search and replace mechanism, as we call it, I think is, is one of the really powerful features of prime editing. So um, it's, it's again, very simple to use design rules uh, to make a new prime editor that can go to a very specific DNA sequence in the genome. Let's take, for example, the beta hemoglobin uh, locus, uh, where you might try to correct a disease causing mutation, like the sickle cell mutation. So you could very specifically target that sequence and then make a change. You can replace that sequence with a new DNA sequence that encodes again, a sort of corrective edit that would correct that disease causing mutation. And then on the very next day in principle, you could make a new prime editor that targets a gene called CFTR that causes cystic fibrosis and correct a three nucleotide deletion in that gene, such as the common th uh, Delta 308 uh, allele, uh, and insert back those three bases and correct that mutation. So uh, again, it's very flexible in this regard that you can um, go to very, very many different sites in the genome in this programmable manner, as we call it. And it's also very flexible in the types of changes that it can make to DNA. So prime editing can make all possible DNA base substitutions. So you know, we have four different uh, letters in our DNA, A, C, uh, G, and T. So prime editing can make a substitution of any one of those letters to any of the other letters. So these are single base pair substitutions or point mutations, as some call them. Uh, we can also make very precise insertions of various lengths. So you know, up to 100 plus base pairs can be inserted and anything between one and, and 100 really is also possible, just, to, just as feasible. And similarly, you can, you can make very precise deletions um, and, and really any combination of those things, it's kind of just up to what you encode in this replace part of our prime editing system. Um, and when you put all together these different types of edits, it's actually uh, uh, quite uh, uh, amazing what you could potentially do with that. Um, so when you look at the types of mutations that occur in humans that, uh, that are responsible for causing genetic disease, about 90% of them fit within this group of changes, these single base substitutions or insertions or deletions. Um, so prime editing in principle as a technology has the potential to address a very large fraction of pathogenic mutations in humans. Um, but we can also do other things. So, you know, beyond these, these simpler, maybe simpler edits, um, we can also remove repeats that have expanded. So this is a large group of diseases that are called re repeat expansion diseases. A classic example is Huntington's disease. Um, and prime editing systems that have been developed can remove those repeats uh, entirely or replace them with normal healthy length repeats. And we, we are very excited about this, this potential uh, uh, application of the prime editing technology. And, and we continue to innovate on the technology. Um, we have a dual flap prime editing system or twin prime editing system that we use. And um, we're also combining prime editing systems with recombinase enzymes to mediate uh, larger insertions, for example, of gene size uh, DNA fragments at targeted locations in the genome, and we call this system passage. Um, so, you know, bro broadly, prime editing is expanding, I'd say, as, as we continue to innovate, uh, as is the sort of um, the types of changes we can make to genetic sequences. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of advantages, I think, for, for how this technology works. Um, one of the uh, strong advantages is that it doesn't generate double strand breaks. Um, we use a gene editing system that's based on CRISPR-Cas. Uh, that system naturally evolved to make double-strand breaks in DNA. Um, those are called nucleases, those forms of the CRISPR-Cas technology. Uh, we have made changes to those, those CRISPR-Cas enzymes so that they don't make cuts in both strands of DNA, but instead in just one of the two strands of DNA. That's really important for um, uh, minimizing the damage at the site uh, that you're trying to edit. Um, uh, and it also is, has important implications for minimizing off-target editing sites in the genome. So um, when we've looked at the off-target events that are uh, editing events that are caused by prime editors at other locations in the genome that we're, we're not trying to edit, 
we've really found minimal to no evidence of off-target editing for many different targets that we've looked at. Um, so this has, you know, obvious implications for the safety of these technologies, um, and uh, we believe that this could be a really good feature of the prime editing system. Um, lastly, I'd say that, you know, prime editing can work in many different types of tissues. Um, certain DNA uh, repair processes are really critical for certain gene editing approaches. For example, using uh, double strand breaks and homologous recombination. Uh, and uh, prime editing doesn't require that same machinery, which is typically not active in, uh, in cells that are of therapeutic interest that are not dividing. So uh, we really feel that prime editing has this, this sort of broad applicability to different tissue types, different cell types uh, to, to be used for different therapeutic applications. Great, thank you. That was a really thorough explanation of prime editing and what it's, its uses today. So thank you, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about, we at the top of the call, we talked slightly about your pipeline, but I'd really like to go mm -hmm. through it a little bit. Talk us through Prime Medicine's pipeline and exactly how you're using Prime Editing. Yeah, so we've thought about this pipeline uh, on a big picture level as you know a group of things that we think we could move forward very quickly. They apply Prime Editing technology maybe in its sort of most, um, the simplest form, the, the form where we're correcting point mutations or making small insertions or deletions, um, and also in tissues where we believe uh, there's precedent for delivery to uh, of gene editing components to the cell types that are, are required for, for a therapeutic benefit. So um, this sort of falls into, I think, three broad buckets of, of indications. Um, you know, one is uh, editing ex vivo in uh, of blood cells. So for example, in hematopoietic stem cells, uh, and in a, a disease called chronic granulomatous disease, we've uh, identified a mutation, a two base pair deletion mutation in a gene uh, that we can uh, correct with prime editing. So we can apply this to cells that we've taken from a patient. Uh, and so in this ex vivo context, uh, we can do the editing and then give those, those hematopoietic stem cells back to the patient after correction, uh, where they can engraft and restore uh, the, the blood system with, with um, newly edited and, and functional uh, blood cells. Uh, and this can be applied to a variety of other uh, diseases of the blood, uh, for example, Fanconi anemia, which we're also working on. Um, so outside of these ex vivo approaches for, for hematopoietic stem cells, we also identified um, uh, targets in the liver uh, where lipid nanoparticle delivery of, of RNA uh, encoded prime or uh, editing systems has, has been established. So um, you're probably very familiar with the work that Intellia has done and others are doing to use lipid nanoparticles encapsulating RNA to deliver to hepatocytes um, in the liver and, and make gene edits. So uh, we are we have programs in Wilson's disease and in glycogen storage disease where we're uh, uh, developing prime editors to correct mutations that, that cause those disorders. So again, another uh, organ system or tissue type where their delivery has been established. And in the last sort of category, it's actually two, two different categories are the sort of um, small compartments like the eye and the ear where uh, adeno-associated virus or AAV delivery systems have uh, been developed and there's precedent for using those for gene editing systems. Um, so we have uh, programs in retinitis pigmentosa um, as well as uh, hearing loss that, that are applying AAV for those uh, indications. So that's sort of our immediate bucket where we think we can you know, move pretty quickly because again, the delivery is not uh, as much of a, a bottleneck or a hurdle. Um, but then we also think there are a lot of things that prime editing could do that, that are potentially really special and could address uh, patient populations that have had really little to no um, therapeutic uh, options up to this point and are now really devastating diseases. And, and a big category of these, what we call differentiation indications are repeat expansion disease uh, uh, indications. So these include things like Huntington's disease, Friedrich's ataxia, myotonic dystrophy, and a few others where, again, our strategy is to remove those repeats uh, with prime editing. Um, and, and it requires a different approach depending on what the exact gene is and where the repeats are in that gene. Uh, but generally, we have a, a suite of prime editing systems that could address these in principle. Um, however, the delivery to the tissues of interest to, to have a therapeutic effect isn't as straightforward. For example, Friedrich's ataxia, uh, there, there is pathology both in the central nervous system as well as the heart. Uh, in myotonic dystrophy, there's, uh, you know, we have to deliver to muscle cells 
in ALS, for example, again, you have to deliver to the CNS and Huntington's as well. So there's uh, sort of delivery hurdles or challenges there that need to be overcome, but we believe that the prime editing uh, system could be really a powerful approach to, the, to these diseases. So uh, as the delivery kind of improves and as solutions come on board for that, we feel like we'll be well poised to, to move those programs forward. And in, in the similar vein, we have other differentiation uh, indications outside of the repeat expansion diseases uh, that include uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy as well as cystic fibrosis, where again, the delivery to those tissues, muscle and lung respectively, uh, aren't as well established, but prime editing has, I think, really unique potential to address those, uh, those uh, indications. So that's sort of our pipeline. Um, and obviously this is a, a broad pipeline <laughs> that was eight, there are 18 things on that list officially. We, I didn't even mention something that's not uh, officially on our pipeline, which is uh, the use of our passage approach to ge generate uh, CAR T cells, uh, where we've been able to do targeted integration of a uh, chimeric antigen receptor at the track locus in T cells with 60% efficiency, and as well knock out other genes that would be important for uh, allogeneic car. Um, so we, we have a lot that we're doing and a lot to do. And I think we are exploring lots of different ways to move all of these things forward. Obviously, as a biotech company that, that only has a couple hundred employees, it would be hard to move all this forward on our own. So I think we're you know looking for various solutions, including partnering to help bring these forward. Good, good. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for the uh, detailed explanation of your pipeline plans for going forward and, you know, and your, your willingness and interest to work with partners. So hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll hear some, some good news out of this podcast even. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's what I want to know next, you know, what does the next say handful of years, three to five years look for, what is it, or I'm sorry, what does it look like for prime editing? What does this sort of near term future look like? Yeah. So the very near term, as I said, our pipeline has a few uh, indications that are sort of our immediate bucket where we think we can move fast and we have a little bit of a clearer path to the clinic. And that is the most true for our uh, chronic granulomatous disease or CGD indication where we've nominated a development candidate and we hope to have an IND filed you know, sometime in 2024. Um, so that's where I think in the very near term, we're going to hopefully get into the clinic and be able to start uh, demonstrating proof of concept and humans of, of a prime editing uh, technology. Um, we also are, you know, interested in moving into those other areas of, of, uh, of uh, immediate indications and, and establishing proof of concept in, in larger animals um, with, with our prime editing approach. Um, um, and in, in particular, we're looking at doing that. Uh, in the liver with our LNP delivery systems, as well as in um, uh, the central nervous system and other tissues with uh, AAV delivery systems. So I think in the, in the first few years, we're looking for, again, further proof of concept of this technology, translating it into the, the right context, building out our preclinical data. And then, you know, in the five-year horizon, hopefully we'll be um, having uh, several INDs where we're able to uh, test this in, in humans. Great. Good. Okay. Um, so regarding the evolution of prime editing, just in general, um, you know, what is the one takeaway you would like selling the podcast listeners to really understand? Yeah. So I would say, you know, the development of prime, prime editing uh, is really just part of, I would say an, an enormous transformative wave in gene editing technologies that has occurred in the last 10 years or so. I think, you know, we're a little bit past now the the 10 year anniversary of the CRISPR Cas9 system being, um, I would say repurposed into a gene editing technology. Sort of those first publications by um, all the big names in the I can't list them all and I would leave people out if I do. So I think, I think the listeners probably know who they are. Um, and, you know, yeah, one after another, we've just seen improvements to these technologies, turning them from a system that in nature is built to destroy viral DNA, essentially is what it seems is the, the majority of CRISPR-Cas systems, that's what they're trying to do. Turn that into a system that has evolved to do that and, and make it into a very precise gene editing tool that can be used in humans. So, you know, and, and again, the evolution of these technologies has, you know, it's been applied further, you know, it's gone the furthest with the very basic 
CRISPR-Cas9 nuclease technology that can cut genes and disrupt those genes. Um, but that's not very controllable and it cannot be used necessarily to make very precise changes, not in a way that is predictable, at least in, in most cases. We've been able to take that system and turn it into a much more precise system with base editing and prime editing, where base editing can make point mutations, a couple different classes of point mutations without making double strand breaks, avoiding all of the consequences that double strand breaks lead to in cells. Uh, that includes, again, um, undesired products at the targeted site in the genome, as well as activation of P53, translocations, lots of other things. And then with prime editing, we've been just able to expand what those changes that we make to the gene are. So again, going from just a couple different base substitutions to all of the base substitutions and insertions and deletions and, and now beyond with, with our sort of passage approach where we can make larger changes to genes and, and do it in a very precise way at a targeted location in the genome. You know, it's very differentiated in, in my opinion from gene therapy, which relies on viral vectors to either uh, integrate randomly into the genome or exist extra chromosomally and 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 uh, and persist in that way. So I think we're just seeing a huge sort of um, huge progress in this area of a technology that was really not even available until ten years ago to something now that we can can program exactly a change in the genome that we'd like to make um, with with a fish, high efficiency and precision. So. Um, I, I think if anybody's listening and is maybe not as familiar with the gene editing field to understand is that this has just been a huge <laughs> endeavor. Many people have gotten involved. There's a ton of excitement around it mm -hmm. and a ton of promise. So, you know, I have a, just a, as an aside, I have a medical background. I was in medical school and, you know, started medical school in 2009 before any of the CRISPR stuff came out and learned about genetic diseases there. And I don't think many people in the room at that time thought that there was much you could do about that, at, at least at the root cause level. And just thinking now, looking back on that, which was, you know, not, not too long ago, 15 years ago or so, and just seeing what might be possible with our technologies that we now have, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, there's no other way to say it. So um, I'm really excited about the potential for that and, and, and on our, our, our understanding of genetics and how it links to human biology and disease is also continuing to grow. So that's just going to be, I think, a, an amazingly powerful tool for us to both interrogate and manipulate bio, human biology, um, hopefully for, for lots of therapeutic applications. For sure. And I, I agree with you. The, the rapid evolution has been really very interesting and fascinating. And so, uh, you know, we'll just have you back in, you know, a year or so, and you can bring us up to speed on exactly how yeah. prime medicine has progressed. Um, we've come to the kind of formal end of our, of our episode here. And at the end of uh, each episode, I like to talk to my guests about who they are when they're not in the office of the lab. And so mm -hmm. uh, my question for you, Andrew, is, you know, what are your summertime activities, hobbies that you enjoy most? Yeah, no, I, I guess I, I am a person that I just like to take long walks, uh, you know, and travel to new places. And, you know, I guess the last few summers haven't been as heavy on the travel because of COVID, but hopefully I can get back to my normal <laughs> routine of going somewhere fun. Uh, that's not entirely true. Last year, I, I did go to Europe. Um, but yeah, I, I think I really like to explore cities, uh, you know, make the most of of what uh, Boston has to offer, go out to restaurants, take walks in the commons and, and along the river. So uh, maybe more low key, just maybe it's a good reprieve from my normal busy days. So that, that's more at my sort of my sort of speed. Yeah, that's good. Well, and, you know, especially in a city like Boston, you could probably there's something you could probably explore and learn each and every day, even yeah, if you know, exactly. it is your it is, you know, your where you reside anyway. So yeah. that's really exciting. Well, good. That's great. Um, well, all right, listeners, that wraps up this episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast. Thanks to my guest, Prime Medicines, Dr. Andrew Anzalone, and to you for tuning in. And to Dr. Anzalone, thank you so much for being here. This was really insightful, and this is our first episode on Prime Editing. So thank you for being our first guest to really explain to us what it is and how it's going to move us forward. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Aaron. Absolutely. Be sure to visit CellandGene.com for all of the timely content we deliver to help you perform your role even better. And we'll talk to you soon.